The Guelph Play Griffins the stink, and the and the Boston Red Sox stink. Let's cue the music. <laughs> Play the music, man. <laughs> This is a big, elaborate plan here. Oh my god, dude, it's electric. <laughs> Man, these motherfuckers are hidden. He's the funniest guy ever. I'm like, no, he's not. <laughs> that was okay. tough for me. That was very tough for me. What is going on, bro? I don't know what's going on right now. I mean, this guy's an idiot, dude. This guy, this guy is an idiot. Did oh, you play when you were in the god. Game? Come on, man. Come on, man. We're gonna, we're gonna fucking, we're gonna fucking slap him. We're gonna slap him, man. I lost a couple hundred grand. You wanna talk, keep talking about it, asshole? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, next deck, <laughs> we didn't, that's not what we knew. We didn't know that. It's all time, man. He's all time. Oh, man. What an intro. I mean, producer Alec. Shout out, producer Alec. Twos. Shout yeah. out, producer Alec. Hey, look at us, Luke. We're back. I mean, we're back, man. Can't wait, man. Cannot wait. And we got a. Thank you. We got my homie, the the boy, coming on today too. Yeah, we got an absolute heater of an interview coming your way in just a couple minutes. We sat down with a former Olympian, Gilmore Junior. Had a great conversation with him. Got in a little speed skating chat. Talked about the CBC show that the two of you were on, and uh, we got some pretty good stories from him that I, I think uh, I think the people will enjoy. But but first things first, Luke. A little bit of an awkward situation here. If you take a look at our logo, and you take a look at Mr. Luke Wilson at the moment, you'll notice something just a little bit different. Luke, you got a haircut, man. Yeah, I'm gonna take the headphones off for a sec because I do want to say. I have a, a, there is a little more hair back here. The headphones are, I'd say it's like a mini mullet, you know, oh. that, that needs to be fixed. So the headphones aren't doing it, you know, that's kind of padding it down a little bit, but uh, wasn't planning on it. But if you want the, the full story here, Belly, yeah. uh, manager Mark lives in LA. I'm obviously in LA in the moment with the cycling stuff. And probably like six months ago, not six, four months ago, he's like, hey, dude, if you need a trim, there's this guy in West Hollywood goat dude's a goat man and i'm like okay what's like he's like he's the best hair he's like the picasso of cutting hair so his name's uh his name's daniel alfonso so i'm like all right man so we go in there and uh or not we i go in there four months ago i'm like yo can i get a trim and he's kind of looking at me he's like yeah dude we end up chopping it up we talk he's a big niners fan i forgive him for that but just a good dude and uh the CBC show, which me and Gil are about to get into, had its premiere. And I'm like, I need to go get another trim. It's been three, four months, whatever. So I go in there and he's just like on it, bro. He's like, yo, I got a vision for you, dude. And I like looked at him. I'm like, send it, send it, boss. Like you just, you know, when you know someone's got something, I could just see the look in his eye. And he yeah. fucking, again, at the moment right now, I don't have it all done up. But at the time I was like, bro, this motherfucker dialed me in bro i felt swaggy as fuck leaving this place so shout out shout out daniel alfonso bro west hollywood what a goat i was i was a little worried that the uh that the tweets finally got to you and you were like all right let me let me chop this man bun off but i'm glad to hear that 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 was if i was still in season i wouldn't have done it because yeah then i would have it would have been letting the the trolls win, but it was like the moment yeah. the Super Bowl ended. A couple of weeks later, I was like, "Well, shit, dude! I, you know, it was a, it was a war of attrition, which I won, and now I got free. I got, <laughs> you know, I can let it be cut." <laughs> uh, all right, but, so let's just jump right into it. Like I said, it was a great conversation with Gil. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna throw to that. We'll jump back on the flip side. We might do. We'll do a couple of quick hits with the NFL. There's been some 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 shuffling in the league over the last couple of weeks, so we'll touch on that. But uh, yeah, enjoy this conversation, and we'll see you on the flip side. All right, joining us now on the podcast, a very special guest, a three-time Olympian, seven-time World Cup medalist, a man known internationally for one of the most sportsmanship things you'll ever hear, something we'll get to a little bit later. You've seen him on your TV screens as the coach of Team Orange on CBC's Canada's Ultimate Challenge. And he's one <laughs> heck of a dude to place some same game parlays with in the NFL. I know him as Good Vibes Gil, but he's much more known as Gilmore Jr. Gil, 
Thank you for joining us, man. How you doing? Dude, what an what an intro, man. That got me gassed up. I'm I'm good. I'm glad happy to be here. We got an Olympian on the podcast, man. I had to I had to do a little bit of prep. I had to do a little bit of research. Let's just jump right into the CBC show. You two going head to head on it. Talk to me about this filming process, getting to work with Luke, all that stuff. Just what what was what was that experience like? Yeah, man, that seems like a long time ago, really. But um, you know, it was only less than a year ago, but what an experience we had film for the whole month of July. And, um, you know, I think getting the chance to get to, to, to meet Luke and, and get to know him, I think was an awesome experience. Obviously I watched him in the NFL was a Seahawks fan for, for a bit there. And, um, you know, we had some times, I think between like the shooting days and what we saw on camera, I think some of the best times we had was off camera. I don't know if we need to get into that. Just oh, yet, we're getting but, into um, it. It's, it's this okay. kind of pod. Yeah, oh, no. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Look, yeah, but I mean, um, you know, I, this guy's I mean, a I was legend. I gonna say, bro. like, getting a chance He's to a see on camp- <laughs> So actually, to come back, the good times Gil comes from one of my buddies here in Calgary, where he came up at a party. You know, I, I don't think I'm one to shy away from having a good time, and he kind of came up. I was holding a bottle of vodka at a, at a little house party, and good times Gil is, is here to here to go. And I brought that to set, and Luke brought it to you guys, and I kind of changed from good vibes Gil to good luck Gil. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it was a great time on set and to kind of see it on camera now and playing all the way, to, playing out the way it is, is, is pretty cool. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out why my shit is fucking blurry, but beyond that, <laughs> all right, beyond that, let me give you my, my rundown here, belly. I come into this thing and I, I really didn't know. I'm sure Gil was in the same place. I didn't really know what I was in for. You know, but you have a general idea. And my general idea was wildly wrong. I mean, it, I don't know if I could have been further away from what I thought I signed up for than what I actually was signed up for. But I felt like in that moment, in those moments, me and Gil just kind of had a, a large bond that formed. So we watch right now, like I think while we're recording this, uh, four episodes of eight have dropped. I'm sure when it, we drop this pod, it'll probably be five or six. But we really did that all in five weeks. So you start in Whistler, really Toronto, dude, because that's where we met, right, Gil? And then it's yeah. like you head out to Whistler or uh, Squamish, BC, and for 35 days or whatever it is, you just are banging out challenges right from coast to coast. And there's some travel, and, and you really get to know people. You know, you got to spend a lot of time, and the coaches – for, for better or for worse, got to spend a lot of time with each other, Belly. And there were some, <laughs> there were some, there were some issues. That's there's what I'll stories. say. We had there's some, some issues. <laughs> there's some stories. <laughs> What's crazy is that looking back on it now, like during the time we were in it, dude, every place that we felt that we filmed felt like we were there for five days. We were only yes. there for two to three days, you know, filming a challenge a day. But man, by the end of getting off set, we we're like, holy crap boys we need to go to we need to go to dinner we need to have a drink like i felt like three years older after we after we filmed donovan halfway through looked like he aged 10 years the guy could barely walk <laughs> so <laughs> i mean it was it was a it was a hell of a time um again seeing it play out on camera but yeah like you said you know it's, it's much like when we travel on the road for for the world cup for for us i'm sure on the road for uh you playing football you get to know get to know people pretty well when you're spending that much time together. Yeah. Here's a question, Gil, and we're going to get into the, your career here soon, but staying on the CBC show. Um, and for those of you who don't know, what we're talking about long story short, I'll kind of like dumb it down. We had six ex Canadian athletes or Canadian ex athletes, excuse me. And uh, we basically got four players that were just randomly picked to us and we were their coach and we went and did all these like, obstacle courses you know across canada and it got pretty intense at moments it got i don't know what the opposite of intense is but whatever that is it got that as well uh and everything in between yes (laughs) but going into that what did you think you signed up for i made the thing like i didn't know what I, i i thought i signed up for and then my next question is the way you coached your team, which I will say right now, I've seen six, even though only four of aired, I have seen six at the moment. Um, Belly, Gil is a is a phenomenal coach, but he's like a fucking silent assassin out here. 
Like I'm talking <laughs> shit, as you can imagine, Belly. I'm out here just running my mouth. It got cut out a lot of it. You know, a lot of my lines got cut. I was a bit surprised, but not that surprised, if you know what I'm saying. So I was like, shit, dude. And I'm trying to like really find like weaknesses in other coaches. Like who can I get on just an emotional roller coaster? Just being, you know, manipulative as fuck. And Gil was just like poker face the whole time. And now that I've seen some of the episodes, I got to see like what he was coaching his team to do. And I'm like, now it makes sense that his team had, his team had a, this is not a spoiler. I mean, if you've been watching, his team had an extreme amount of success. And I, I credit a lot of that to Gil. So Gil, my question to you is t- twofold. One, what did you think you were signing up for? And then two, where did this coaching style that you had, the silent killer, come from? Oh, man, that's a good one. <laughs> so actually, <laughs> what I thought I was signing myself into, I actually had no idea, to be honest. Like, you know, my agent who who handles most of my stuff, he has he has a lot of stuff with um, Amazing Race Canada. And so I thought it's maybe something be along along the lines of that. But, um, you know, never in my, you know, wildest dreams, you think I'd, I'd end up on uh, reality television. So, you know, I didn't really know. I thought I, you know. So I swear to God, I woke up to the email from CBC, from whatever, the casting director. I was so hung over that morning. I thought I was being pranked. Like I was like, I thought I was being scammed from Russia to be, you know, a mail order husband or something like that. And uh, I was going to get whisk, whisked away. But then I got on the call and they started like, you know, hashing this thing out. And, and I found out it was legit. And they're like, what's your, what's your coaching philosophy? And, um, you know, I think one of the came, kind of came back to one of my, my favorite coaches who's um, kind of this old school um, silent type from St. Louis, very like hard nosed, um, very like hardworking. And I just like that's a like, kind of coach that I love to that I love to be love to train for and compete, compete for. And I kind of tried to like he's very cerebral with how he approached um, training and competitions. And it was a lot of just like how your attitude when you come to the the race. And so that was kind of my, my thing is that I can't coach these people through a rope challenge or doing a kayak challenge or whatever it may be. But what I can do is I can, you know, reframe their, their mental space. And and just like, uh, you know, my coach did for me when I first made the national team back in 2010, like I was one of the biggest hotheads, man. Like I was, I think I had broken my hand five times punching shit after races. Um, I would have known this. I could not, could not handle a loss. And um, he kind of reined me in along with some of my teammates to kind of be a little more uh, zen. And I think, you know, you kind of, you kind of alluded to it. I think, I think our coaching styles on the show, if anyone's watched, I would say they have the same effect in, in, you know, we want to win. We're, we're there to compete, but you know, I was Mr. Miyagi and, and uh, Luke was Cobra Kai. You know, he was all about (laughs) killing and and making sure you left a, a wave of destruction wherever you went. And I was more on like the, the silent assassin type, but you know, it all ends up being, you know, coming out on the wash at, at the end. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what I went into. But like, like you kind of alluded to, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. When I saw the list of like Luke Wilson, Donovan Bailey, Clara Hughes, Monique, Jen Kish, I'm like, what, what is happening on this ragtag group of people that they're going to bring around Canada with a uh, 32 strangers or whatever it may be um, doing crazy one- challenges. <laughs> yeah, here's a here's another quick one for you. Is there anything that you said that either did or didn't make the cut that you thought maybe was a little too far offside or really didn't land home? Well, two two things. And I'm I'm okay. <laughs> two things. One was on the um was the pump the trolley, the, the, the trolley, trolley car. Episode three. Yeah. Yep. This is this is when the fire comes out. Bellis right? has like, seen it. Bellis has got, seen it, so he knows. He knows. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know that. So my team gets smoked, man. Like I, I can't believe that 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 challenge. I have two of like my strongest, most coordinated players, and they couldn't even get the thing going. I was walking beside the thing for thirty seconds, being like, "What the fuck is happening?" <laughs> Meanwhile, all these coaches are watching me go first, and they're like, "Well, that's not how you do it." Great. At least we saw, we saw that example. But um, after after that, we see all these teams go. They're smoking us, and my team is just putting their tail between their legs, coiling up, being like, you know, guys, we're going to, we're going to get this next time. Don't feel too bad. And at this point we hadn't really experienced a big loss like that. And I remember Vinny, he's like, Oh, like, it's okay, guys. It's okay. And I turned around, gave him a shove. I was like, 
no, it's fucking not okay. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we got smoked. I want you to feel this loss. This is the most one of the most embarrassing things to happen on camera. And we just like could not figure it out that day. And, and that was something like, you know, that's something that probably my coach would have done to me. I've, I've uh, multiple two times he told me to get my head out of my ass. And it's like when you reply, when you respond to that kind of response from your coach, when you have to, when you need to, um, you know, I think we turned around the next day. But um, yeah, that was one. I'm like, y'all did, man. I hope, I hope they don't show me shoving my player on camera, which I kind of aired out right safe. now. I but. Think you're <laughs> safe. I was, uh, for me, Gil, I was hurt because I kind of wanted this to go in. But I had this kind of weird dynamic with my team early where I came in as somewhat of a jokester, pretty laid back, and they called me out on my shit. And they're like, buddy, we don't want a, a pal. It was Devin M.D. Jones was really the one who said it. He's like, we don't want a friend. She's like, I like you too much. Like, I want to not like you. So I'm like, <laughs> careful what you wish for, Devin. And I remember we were in last place. We started getting a little better. Third episode comes. We're now kind of moving up the standings a little bit, middle of the pack. Fourth, we have the first Elim. And at this point, everything that I'm doing, which is being outrageously idiotic, but in a, in a productive way, is, is starting to work. So I'm like, well, how far can I push this envelope? So four comes, and as I, again, it's already aired, so I can say this, but Juanique's team, Team Yellow, gets eliminated. And I look at my team. <laughs> And I say to them, when they come back here, because they like took them down this bridge, I said, they're going to be crying. And I want you to enjoy their tears. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, but what I would always do is I would, when I said wild shit like this, I would kind of glance over at Devin. And if Devin like was amped the by it, <laughs> then I knew it was good. <laughs> when I said this, she was like, bro, what the fuck is the matter with you? And I was like, okay, too far, too far, too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I didn't that was, that. That was, didn't it, it was funny because our, our, um, our stages were side by side, right? And, it, dude, the wild shit that would come to my left, whether it be Luke wearing a bug net halfway down his face, sunglasses growling, or just like yelling, you know, showtime, showtime, or just saying like the most obscene crap to the, the, the hosts. I was always kind of looked at my team as like, do not. Everything that happens to my left goes as far as me. Then yeah. it's just noise. See, but Belly, uh, he's a smart man though, because what he what he realized is on the other side of this, I would point, I would tap my team, and be like, hey, I'm about to say something <laughs> stupid that I don't mean, but I'm just trying to get in someone's yeah. head. So like everything I'm about to say, don't believe it. And then I would say some wild See, shit, like, man, I'm scared of shit. I don't even know if I could do this challenge. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like, Yo, you were bowling. Like, you were bowling gonna puke those today. Those <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, you know that was uh, those was I, I love those days on set. Although they were a grind, you know five, you know five to eight hours on set in the sweltering sun. It is cool to see how it kind of turns out, and uh, you know at least a lot of my buddies are loving loving the Luke, the team Luke uh, isms and the mannerisms. It's funny, a lot of, a lot of my buddies are just like, "Yo, is he really like that?" I'm like, "Yo, he's really like that." <laughs> It's not just Look for the cameras. Face. I can tell you that. It's not, it's, it's not just for the cameras. The the most jarring thing I've seen on the show so far, and Gil, I'd love to get your thoughts on it, is Luke's bucket hat that he cut the top off of so he could have the man bun come through. One of the more ridiculous, like it, I saw it and like I gasped. And my like my poor mother's reaction too was like, geez, like what is this guy doing? Like with the hair. So I just was the was the that, is the bucket had that ridiculous looking in person as well, or is it just through the TV? Well, I don't I don't know. I think Luke was looking for the shock factor, and you know I was trying to uh, you know play coach too. I wore a visor. I'd never wear a visor, but you know what what would the great coaches do? They would wear visors. But Luke was trying to set a tone, right? And I don't know if I think Claire wore the bucket hat one day. You're like, yo, I want that bucket hat. Like where yeah. can I? Because that wasn't part of your original kit, right? No, and the so one I got you, was actually from Juanique. <laughs> yeah, Juanique gave me and the bucket hat. And I remember hat. you you found the pair of scissors on the bus and just – he literally cut the hole. Like a lot of my friends are like, yo, where do you even get a hat that has a ponytail hole? And he's like – I was like, no, he cut it like that. Like he, he made that hat for himself. So Although, I will – It plays out on camera because it looks like it's meant to be there. <laughs> so I do have some experience in this, boys. 
you gotta understand in college, this is gonna sound really meathead vibes. When we would get like our, let's say we're going to the off season, we get our college workout kits, and we were never supposed to do this. But as you got older, if you were good enough, they'd kind of like, you know, turn a blind eye. You'd sit there in the locker room and you just learn how to cut t shirts and like through fabric and such. Like, you know, you're cutting like stupid amounts of clothes. So I'm like, I've done this before, brought me right back to college. Bing, 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 get the hole in, and there you go. Bucket hat with the hole. You had one chance, and you put it right in the middle. That That's probably oh. one of the most remarkable things. Not even off center. I appreciate that, Gil. I, I, <laughs> Nailed you know that. That's how we do it up there, Belly. And, and Gil did nail him. This is what was tough. This was what was tough for me in the relationship. We spent a lot of time together offset, and he knew what I was doing, where I don't think the other coaches really knew. So, like, he said, like, I was – at the time when they had asked me, like, not be a friend, the next challenge I went bonkers. We were pushing a bale of hay – and they they really they went they really dimmed that down because I was out of fucking control. Even me, I'm like this shit is out of control, dude. Like I'm going fucking nuts, screaming. Like at one point, I yelled at one of my players to wipe that look off his face. I'm like, wipe the fucking look off your face. Okay, we did pretty well. Orange beat us. Gil beat us. A prick. But uh, <laughs> at that point, afterwards, I could see that they were like shell shocked by the wild 180. So I was like, I'm just going to start wearing weird shit and just like be the freak on the show that everyone's kind of a little bit afraid of. <laughs> yeah, there it is. There it is. <laughs> I mean, those glasses like the fact too, I would that never looks like wear it's supposed those. to be there. Yeah, I would never wear those, but I had them for cycling. Those are my cycling glasses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But well, anyway, you know what's funny is you bring that you bring up that Hinton yes. day and that's like one of those days it's like <clears throat> it started off just as normal. It was raining. It was kind of miserable. We got on our bus and then kind of like as we're starting to get off, it, you kind of give me this look like, all right, showtime. Like this is where it starts. Dude, sleeve, Luke's short shorts, sleeveless, no hat, drenched in the rain. And he's standing there stoic on the platform. I'm like, yo, this motherfucker trying to get his team amped. He's like, show no weakness. Show no weakness. <laughs> When we go to lunch, he's like, yo, I'm fucking freezing out there. I'm so cold. And then he's like, all right, got to go back on set. All right. Oh, I'm tough. I'm tough. <laughs> I was cold as fuck. Well, Belly, here we go. And, Gil, you can and then you got this. sick. You got sick. Yeah, I did get sick. And then they're like, I'm like I lost my voice. I wonder how. But I remember sitting there. This is maybe a shot at myself here. But I, I kind of alluded to not knowing what I signed up for. At this point, we're in episode uh, end of two, going into three, and we're in dead last. And I'm like, man, I'm like, everybody here has like a crazy story or like super emotional or like just very whatever you want to call it. And I'm like, bro, that just ain't me. So I start thinking, I'm like, well, what is me? And I'm like, well... I know how to win fucking games. <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> so I'm like, fuck it. I'll be that guy. My team asked for it. And I had one goal from there on out. Drive the motherfucking bus as hard as I physically can. And that was pretty much what I tried to do. Did it work all the time? Brought, no. But it works brought, sometimes. It sounds like you brought NFC West football to CBC's Canada's ultimate challenge. Yo, yeah. Max. That's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great point. I was going to say it out in the rain. Like, uh, that was the most Seattle Seahawk. Like, just rain. Don't give a fuck. I'm tougher than you. I can see that, like, nine to six win over the LA Rams or the St. Louis Rams, I guess, at the time. So, yes. It seems like you say, it seems like it's working. Your team's climbing its way to the basement. For anyone that hasn't watched, there will be some sports. We got to get through Orange, though. Keep watching. Tune in. We got to get through Orange. Were there any challenges that, uh, because I haven't seen the show, were there any challenges that you guys got to participate in or no? No, we took none? the fat bikes for a rip. That was yeah, pretty yeah, much the did. only thing. Were there any that but, you guys saw that you were like, shit, like I would fucking, I'd be so good at this. Like if they just let me take this for a spin or, or that looks kind of fun. Gil, well, honestly, for me, it was only the, the only thing that I probably wanted to do was make the run up the ski jump just because, mm. you know, that's something that I probably could have done. Um, but the other one is probably just a fat bike because you know, we cycle for training a lot and, um something that i knew i probably had the capacity for but fuck man some of those challenges i'm glad i didn't do because a i'm scared of heights and and b i don't have the upper body to uh to do anything i was a speed skater for a lot of years i don't think we did a lot of bench press 
Well, you know what I would have loved to see you on? And the one that I wanted to do, and I wanted to attempt it solo, was uh, the plane pull. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I – I mean, I, I didn't really get to pull it, but I was like, you know, Gil, I mean, the way I'm sure it's similar in speed skating, like training, that was one where I was like, this is really up my alley. I can kind of use my weight. I have quick enough feet, and, like, I know how to, like, drive my legs in the ground. And it was funny, like, even that challenge, listening to, like, you talk. I shot Gil a note. I was like, damn, that's such a great coaching point. I should have said that shit, Belly. Was my coaching point to the team is I said to them, I'm like, listen, don't try and pull this plane with your arms. If I see you heave hoeing, I'm going to fucking lose my mind. <laughs> okay? And I did. That's how I talked to the team. I'm like, don't you dare fucking heave ho this. I'm like, we're going to go. We're going to – I call it like pushing the ground away. That was like a, always a big football point in the gym was like, hey, if they want like force in the ground, they'd be like, try and push the earth away. Where Gil and my team was kind of looking at me like, yeah, they kind of got it. But Gil had the better way when he was like, yo, dig your heels into the ground. And naturally that kind of, and then all of a sudden these fuckers beat us by one second. I was so upset with that or whatever it was. Bro, you gotta know that my team, at that point, my team took a big, big size disadvantage there. Yeah. Like big size yeah, was was tough. disadvantage. It was and tough. We still, it was we still tough. smoke them. It was a tough moment. <laughs> But this has been a lot of CBC chat. We might we gotta talk speed skating, Belly. We gotta get we into do. this because I got so many questions. You you started off, but I we gotta talk, bro. Okay, so let's let's start. I, I'm curious about the beginning, right? Kid from Calgary. Like I, we, you and I were chatting a little bit while Luke was having Wi-Fi issues before we got rolling here. I found a very grainy clip from the 2007 Canada Winter Games. When did speed skating become? something that you could target as like a future future goal as a as a kid yeah well i thought i started speed skating when i was 13 I, I played hockey from when i was seven up until that point and um you know played at the highest level uh, at least in my communities and when i was 13 years old i mean luke knows i'm not a big guy but i had guys in my at my age that were like six eight tyler myers played against him uh, i think he's on the canucks now and you know he was man crushing me head down coming out of the or, uh, defensive zone and just smoked plastered. I was like four, four, 11, 130 pounds wet. And so my dad uh, was just watching TV one night and he's like, he saw an ad for the, at, for the Olympic oval, having an identification camp for speed skating. And, you know, that's kind of, I got kind of lucky with the Olympic oval being from my hometown and a part of the legacy of the 88 Olympics. And um, I think out of fear, probably for my health, he's like, Hey, we should put you in this. I wasn't doing anything that summer, and um, you know, I was always one of the better skaters on my team. Maybe not the most skilled, but a good skater, and you know, I picked it up right away. Um, one of the coaches thought I had potential, and you know, suggested I sign up for the club. And when I when I say it's been a, like a quick 19 years of speed skating, that's honestly what it's what it's felt like. Like I still remember that first day in September of like joining the club and meeting my first team and getting you know, together with my first coach and start like picking away a technique and technique for the next 19 years. And like, I, I remember pretty much every season, uh, the big competitions, the big uh, races, the races that I learned a lot. And, um, you know, from that kind of development path, it's like I said, it's been a quick 19 years of just like progression and, 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 and speed skating. How was, how was your first race? You still remember it? Uh, first race, I think, oh yeah. I actually I was competing against like forty year old men because I was How like old you? they were just like it was no I was thirteen oh I was thirteen because they were just what? they just clump they just clump <laughs> they just clumped us all together in like a speed category so you could have been you know fifty years old thirteen uh, eight years old as long as you were all the same speed around the same PBs you would you would compete against each other I'm sure it's like probably like tra it's like track cycling right like it's you know, you Maybe. kind of are I, I haven't really ages. competed. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> I'm not good <laughs> enough to compete like that. <laughs> but yeah, so I think in my first race, I'm, I probably stomped on like a, you know, 48 year old in the 500 meter, but then, you know, come a longer distance, he probably took me to school. But uh, um, yeah, that was my first race is in Rocky Mountain House in Alberta. And um, I had to leave the races early because I had a hockey game, um, you know, that night. But uh, That's a yeah, I, I think I've progressed right there. Yeah. yeah, I had to uh, – I think I progressed a little from from, uh, from beating up on some 48-year-old. I, I uh, like – From I, Masters. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. On the note of firsts, again, we, we were talking a little bit beforehand, so I got to get this 
story out of you. Those 2007 Canada Winter Games, you sne- you get into the semifinals. I believe someone from Quebec was DQ'd in the quarters. You get mm-hmm. into the semis. You make good on that. You make the finals. And then there you are, 16 years old, Winter Games, about to race on live television for the first time, I believe. And uh, yeah. how was how was that experience? Your first time racing under the bright the bright lights. <laughs> Dude, that that was a that was a whirlwind, man. Cause like, so Canada Winter Games for us, that's like our big competition as as young skaters. And um, for myself, you know, I was going against nineteen year olds that had represented Canada at the Junior World Championships. These guys were studs, Junior World Records, Junior Championships. You know, competing against some of the best seniors. And there I was, sixteen years old, um, kind of like my first time being big time, being on TV. And I managed to get my way into the A final. And that, those finals, it was crazy. There wasn't an empty seat in the house. We were in White Horse. The rink was rocking. Um, because there were some delays, we just ended up on live TV for on TSN. And Rob Black was announcing it. It was it was crazy, man. And I remember there's one shot in the final where you see me. I'm a 16 year old baby face kid, and the fear in my eyes and the nervousness is palpable. Like you can just see it. And, um, you know, I try to do my best to focus in and, um, you know, we got to do these cool things where we had our helmets off as we get our names announced and, and get called to the line. But my, my, my race was over one lap in. I eat mats on live TV, come dead last and, and stumble across the line. And that's actually when I first, that's when I broke my hand for the first time because I punched a lot of shit after that race. And I was like so upset that I got on live TV and just, face first into the mats and bounced out. And, uh, but yeah, that was kind of, I learned a lot of lessons in, at that competition, you know, like, like I said, going against some of the best guys in the world kind of proved to myself that I could, uh, hold myself to that caliber. And, um, that kind of really set the tone for the rest of my career of just like, yeah, I can do this and be compete amongst the best. Okay. Gil, I got, this is a guy I've obviously watched speed skin growing up just like every Canadian kid. But as I got older, and I've, you know, being able to meet some different athletes here, maybe not that event because you were 16, but let's, let's fast forward to an event where you're, let's call it 20, you know, 21. <laughs> what is the culture of speed skating off of the ice? And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> did you have certain guys that you were really close with rivals? Is it, you know, one of the things with Donovan Bailey on the show was he was talking about how like, yo, we'd have this four by one relay team, which obviously for the Canadians out there, won gold in Atlanta. But he's like, but on the side, these guys are trying to beat me in the 100 meters. And then I've, I've spent a little time with like in the rugby world, another, you know, and this is kind of wondering where on the spectrum does uh, speed skating fit in? Because the rugby guys will go out and crack each other's heads. And then all of a sudden it's like the game's over and we're all just going to get together and drink as many beers as humanly possible. And it was that was a little strange for me. Like even there were some moments, not often, I don't want to make it sound, but like. You know, there's some NFL games where I'm like, okay, like I probably said some foul things today. I didn't mean it, you know, but like, I don't know how you took it. <laughs> so it's like, you go say like, yo, what's up, man? And 99 times out of 100, it's like respect. But it, it is like a little bit, I mean, you've seen the odd videos of guys getting fights after the game. Where I almost wonder like, what is it like? Take me through like, okay, you just go, you, you talk about how you're a hothead when you lose. Do you talk shit when you win? Are you on the are, when you're the man now? In a couple years, are you on the line? Like I'm about to dust you, motherfuckers. Are you talking shit? Is it very like golf like, very classy? Not, I will say when I say golf like, not like waste management because that place is carnage. Shout out waste management. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't ever. I never think it got to the point where you know, like Tiger Woods, he's handing a tampon to his a uh, to his a uh, competitor. It never got to that point. <laughs> But yeah, speed skating, speed skating is like an old school sport, eh? Like it's, uh, it's probably the, the purest form on ice. It's uh, get get yourself a pair of blades and say who's faster. Yeah. And so in that sense, there's a lot of like, um, you know, it's very old school, very proper. You line up with your pair and you just you just race. But you know, I think I've heard stories back in the old days of some of the the shit that the old school skaters used to do after the races, and uh, they used to hand out beers and anti doping. Like that's that's a real thing, just to, at uh, anti-doping you know, or with get, doping in it. With What's doping, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, like you would you so you got selected for for doping control, and um, you got to the the control room or whatever. They had coke, they had um, water, and they had beer. Wow! Just so they helped you go piss. Yeah, like those 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 days were crazy, and 
you know, once I got to the national team and, and the world circuit, like um, it wasn't like that, but um, you know, I think we're trying to break out of it where I think speed skating is really serious in a lot of ways, just because it's very linear, you know, it's two guys, do they race two girls, they race. And it's just like, it's over, but there's a lot of fun. There's a lot of characters. And, and like you said, after the competitions, man, we would, we had some pretty, we had some epic times, um, you know, whether it be in the ne Netherlands where we're packing this uh, one bar called Cafe Hausha. It's, it's like oh, a like legendary like speed skating bar. Yeah. And dude, it was like, just jam pack with the best speed skating in the world, doing the wildest shit, like dancing on the roofs, fucking throwing beers across the bar, breaking windows. Like, yeah. See bellies. Yeah. Look at Belly's old, face old right now. Old school speed skating was crazy. I think. So we have this one party every year. Uh, it's called our oval finale. And we got to a point where no, no bar in Calgary was wanting to host us. Cause they, we just had this reputation of just like, <laughs> our bus rolling through an absolute <laughs> chaos ensuing, whether it would be going to national here in Calgary and puking on the bowling lanes, people getting <laughs> tossed through the front, um, the, the front glass, like, dude, this shit was wild. And it's a, it's a party now. It's kind of subdued. The younger generation, they don't kind of, you know, we, we used to He's tie a real it up, one, but Gil's uh, a real one. Belly, yeah. Let me give you a little <laughs> heads up here, dude. And this is something that I all I've taken with me forever, but I decided this, actually early in college and i was like you know for me i can't really like i i judge a lot of my friends in my life and people in my life based on how they are when it's time to party you know i think <laughs> true colors show up then and, and i can't trust a guy who doesn't drink i'm not saying you gotta you be are. an alcoholic by any means you, you are so from windsor that it is scary <laughs> <laughs> that's very fair that's a very fair statement but you know you see gill Again, I don't know this guy. And this is where it's all making sense now. And like, we're on the road. This is early on. I, I know him for two weeks, you know, we're chopping it up. It's like, yo, let's go to dinner. And we might have put our foot on the gas one night. And I was like, holy fuck, man. <laughs> this guy is, and I mean this in the best way, but he's a maniac, dude. <laughs> and that's when I felt like our relationship took a step to the next level, you know. But it was, you know, I, I think that's a, that. that might be a Windsor thing. That might be a Windsor thing, but it's also a Calgary thing, man. I it's there we go. I think there when you go. share when you share a beverage with someone, a cocktail, you kind of you get to learn a lot about them. <laughs> and uh, you know that's that's what I've I've never been I've never said no to a to a drink from a from somebody. If someone offers me a drink, I say yes. And you know, luckily Luke offered me a lot of drinks on on uh, on the road that we were able to bond and, and really get to know each other. So uh, yeah, and I think that's the kind of the the best thing. When, yeah, when we get to travel on the road and meet a lot of people from the other countries and and uh yeah we get to have those bonding moments where you know you get to see everyone's true colors and as, as serious as they might be on the ice they're great guys off the ice that you know you can uh you can like chop shit with between the races and, and chirp them um whether they're on a good one or a bad one so yeah it's um species and culture is a is a bit boring sometimes but there's some some really good characters in it that uh i had a lot of good guys when i was coming up that we would just rip Get it after it I've, what about pre-race yeah. vibes i'm sure it's different for everybody but like generally again you want to talk about the nfl most times the right before we go out like after warm-up we come in right before the anthem there's like a 20 minute break and we'll head out there in like when i was very young it was a guy named red bryant who was an iconic speech giver then for the next years of my life it was the majority cam chancellor and then when cam had his injury Bobby Wagner took over. So you can imagine that like these speeches will get you fucking right, bro. How did it go for like you guys? Like when you show up to race day, are you giving the speech? Is, is it is it more of a like, hey, let's be tactical today? Or is it more like, bro, light your hair on fire. Let's go fuck these boys up. Like what's the vibe? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's different for everyone, right? So, you know, it's different from football to speed skating because we're all skating at different times, like different events. Like in the 500 meter, there was only three guys, four guys that were doing it, you know, from our team. Yeah. So I'd show up with the same four guys. And as soon as we got to the rink, everyone kind of dispersed, did their own warm up, did their own preparation. Some guys did the whole, like I would do the full two hours before my race. From the time I got in, did my warm up and then planned it every to like the minute. Some people got to the rink and just sat there for 30 minutes and just mellowed out, listened to music. It was kind of different for everyone. Um, I was more on like just 
you know, my coach would say a couple things where I would, you know, hone in some of the technical cues, but then I was just like, crank the music, get that going. And, and that's what would pump me up a little kickstart my heart, nickelback animals, stuff like that, that got me going. And, and that's, I, that's all the motivation I needed. But, um, yeah, speed skating is just different because it is an individual sport and like what, what, what might work for somebody doesn't work for the other guy. And so not everyone really responded to the raw, raw speeches. I, I did, you know, my coach telling me to get my head out of my ass. That's something I'm like, holy fuck, I need to turn up right now and get myself, get myself going. But you know, it's spe- like, especially the 500 meter, it's a weird, cause if you get too amped, you have no control over your fine motor functions. Your skates are everywhere. You're too tight. So you kind of like gotta be in a state where you're like, you know, almost zenned out to a, like a frequency of like where you're ready to, to rip, to rip it up. So it's a, it's a finicky sport speed skating. Some days you're, you know, some days you hit it and go fast and sometimes you're just off the pace and you're, you're, you know, 10 places back from where you normally would be and you did nothing different. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a different sport for sure. But okay. I do want to. I do want to say. Oh shit! Oh, oh, oh shit! Oh, what do we got? Watch this. Take us through this moment. What's going on? What's going on? All right. What's so, going on? So Gil? Here, this is this is a cool race. This is uh, one of the World Cups uh, from my best season. Can we in pause it real quick. Look at this fucking legend right here, Belly. Look at him, bro. You want to talk about aerodynamic? Down start. <laughs> I started a bit different from everyone else, but uh, this is like, a, you know, we took it from roller, like inline skating from track starts. So, um, yeah, this is me against one of my teammates. This season, our team was on fire, man. We had all five of our guys in the top 10. And at this point in the season, we were all in the top five. And so, um, you know, we were always duking it out. We were one of the last pairs to go. I think I, there was only one pair after this with two Canadians. So I hadn't won a medal at all this, uh, this season yet. And so going to this race, I just needed to get to the leaderboard. I just wanted to get on the podium. And so, um, you know, this, my coach and I worked a lot on this, this race and, you know, I come out, dude, this emotion, I didn't even know I was going to win the race here. I just knew I was going to get a medal and fuck. I was amped. We don't get a lot of people to come out for speed skating events. There's a couple of people in the stands, but I was yelling, man. I was okay. Dude, okay. Full blown. Yeah. I, I've got some. I've got and, so many questions. If you don't mind, if you don't mind, Gil, I got yeah, want no, you to relive no, no. some Let's glory go. days. Okay, so right now, okay. let's go. Um, if we can get producer Alec to run this thing right back to the beginning, because I, I would love to know. Like, the, I I just really enjoy the mentality of other sports. So right now, you said you don't know. Like, you've been working on this shit. You're feeling pretty amped. Yeah. The stance is electric, and the gloves are I, they're iconic, bro. It's like some Michael Jackson <laughs> shit right there. Yeah, and you got the Nike. Sh- check on it so you know me football guy friday night lights okay so here we go yeah so you're on the outside lane like yeah do you so do you take like a line do i'm chomping at the the corner yeah so do i'm chomping at the bit there's a couple things that go into that outside lane it's like i'm coming out of this corner now drafting this big ass guy right like one of my teammates i can kind of get a draft and get sucked into uh that back stretch but you know coming into that that start you know, I'm like repeating very simple, very simple things to myself. Just like, it's just like launch hips down, launch hips down. Like those are just going through my head like repeatedly. And it's very, it's like, it's very simple thoughts. Like I almost say, say this sometimes, like to be a good speed skater, you got to be kind of dumb. Like you Ooh. cannot think about too many things at once. If you do too, That's like, true. if you think too much, then you go slow. You just got to kind of just lay it all out. So here it's just like, drive, drive, drive. And we do these starts so many times. It's like the tempo is up, 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 up. And then it's like smooth it out. And it's all just all mechanical. And it's just like oh. hit your entry, go on backstretch, low corner, drive, finish. Sick. It's now, a checklist of literally like 10 things. Yeah. And the backstretch, uh, you know, the race so is over just the like inside that. lane on the second one. At that point, I'm yep. assuming at any point, are you kind of seeing your peripherals like, yo, I've got them. Or is it just like you're just actually, actually it? that race in particular? I thought I was gonna lose it. Like really? I came out of the corner and I kind of like started getting my speed, but then he started pulling away a bit. And I was like, "Holy fuck! How did I lose this race with a with an in finishing behind him like that? Like getting the draft on the backstretch? Like how do I lose this race?" And then it kind of became ten meters before the corner. And I'm like, "No, turn it on, lean that like for those corners, man. Like you just gotta lean it over. You just gotta trust your skates, lean it over." and trust that your blades are going to hold yourself up and you're going, you know, 
59 kilometers, 60, 60 kilometers in a corner and you're just picking your feet up, just going like that. So, then, uh, yeah. Tell me about the last 20 meters. Like how do your legs feel oh, in the last 20 meters? Bro, full lactic. If you kind of see my legs, they're just Bambi, man. I'm just trying to grasp and get to the line as fast as I can. Like at that point, I probably kicked for the line, you know, five meters too early, but that's like all I literally had. It's your legs are like exploding. You have, you're losing that control in your, in your, in your legs. And it's just like, get me to the line. You're trying to think about those simple technical cues. Like I said, push to the side, push to the side. But like, once your legs start screaming, it's like, you only got so many pushes before you're, you're fully like lactic, sit myself down and, and, you know, grab yourself a beer. That's Which sick. I don't know if you could see, like, because we're cut like this, but there is just over in like this corner. I don't know if you oh. can see it. In oh, cut yeah, we got corner. you. There it is. There it is. There, this one. This yeah. is what I got for for winning that race. Oh. Big, like four liter German beer. Was able to pop that with my teammates after the race. That was a that was a good trophy to win. I like that. How about producer Alec getting? Getting the vid that has the yeah. that has the drink, the German beer in the background. What a what a he's chances on it. right he's now. On. He's on it. <laughs> you gotta give this guy a raise, man. Shit. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Right. <laughs> <laughs> preach, producer Alec in the chat going preach. Yeah. Um, Gil, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, speed skating, it's a very, you know, it's a very individual sport, different things work for different people, but, and then there you are at your first Olympics, 2014 opportunity of a lifetime in the, it was the thousand meter, correct. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's the, it's the act of sportsmanship that everyone's talked about. So, you know, we, we got to get the story out there with you here as well. Just take me through that process of, of, you know, yeah. giving up your spot, handing it over to a teammate, like it, Hey, he did great. He went on to win a silver, you know, the stories that I read say he was a, you know, people say he was a stronger skater perhaps, but like, where are you at mentally there throughout that process of this is, this is my first Olympics. It's a huge stage, yeah. but you know, I probably should hand this off to my teammate. What was that process like? Yeah. I mean, that was a, an interesting time for sure. So kind of, I guess the preamble of that is that we have an Olympic trials in December and um, you know, that size our whole Olympic team. So the 500 meter happened on the first day and I qualified, um, that day I finished second. So already punched my ticket to, to the games, uh, day three, I think, uh, was a thousand meter and you know, I'm on a high, all I got to do is, you know, I just got to rip it. I'm going to the games anyway. So I have literally nothing to lose. You know, I, I go when I finish, I think I was sitting third place at the time of Denny going and then, you know, the air goes out in the stadium and he falls, you know, he has this like unbelievable, no one can believe it happened. He fell literally coming out of the last corner and, um, he goes, he does a, you know, a reskate after he finishes fifth. So he's now the alternate on the team. And so coming out of those Olympic trials, I now have a guaranteed spot in the, the 500 meter I'm third spot in the thousand and Denny's the alternate. And, um, you know, I was telling you about my old school St. Louis coach, dude, if I, on the, after his reskate, when he finished fifth and became the alternate, I, I like looked at one of my teammates. I'm like, dude, I'll give Denny my spot in the world of speed skating. You know, where you rank the 500 meter. I was one of the best in the world, had won a world cup race earlier that year. You know, I was challenging for an Olympic medal thousand, man. I couldn't, I wasn't even in the top 20. Right. So I looked at one of my teammates. I was like, fuck, I'll give Denny my thousand, my thousand meter spot. Like he's way better at this than I am. But then like my, my teammates is like, don't even say that. Don't even say that to Mike. Like he'll kill you. And, um, Mike's my coach. And like, I, I agreed. If I still, if I told my old school St. Louis coach that I was going to quit and not skate the thousand meter at the, at, at the Olympics, the guy would have cut my head off. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I guess I'm skating a thousand. Like he was so pumped. He was, he was happy for me that I was like qualified for do two distances at my first Olympics. And we went through the whole month of January preparing to skate the, the thousand meter at the games on, on top of the 500. And, um, you know, I think one of the things I do have to mention is that like in speed skating and, and like Luke knows and in the football locker room, it's like, you become very close to the people that, um, you know, you train with and, and, and compete with on a daily basis. And, you know, our group was like really special. We all were very close and really like trusted each other. And on more than any speed skating team that I've been on, we had a group of guys that were like 
unreal mentors to me and really good friends and really good buddies. We had a lot of great memories. And um, so we would train, Denny and I trained together that whole month and he was helping me out trying to get ready for the thousand. I was helping him, him out trying to get ready for like the 1500 meter, which he qualified for. And so like he was going to the Olympics no matter what. And then, um, so fast forward to the games, I skate the 500 meter and, um, you know, things don't go well for me. I finished 10th, um, still a good result, I guess, but not what I was expecting. Um, 10th in the world and, uh, 10th in the world, yeah, 10th of the games. It wasn't bad. I was the top Canadian and, uh, I was so proud, but I, I really wanted to win a medal. Um, you know, 2010, I almost quit speed skating, but I was watching the Vancouver Olympics and funny enough is watching Denny Morrison win a gold medal in a team pursuit that's like, fuck, I got to keep skating. That's an unbelievable feeling. I want to give that feeling back to the nation. And so I went through those four years being like, I got to create a medal moment for Canada. I got to create a medal moment for Canada. So the 500 meter happens, don't do it. And um, my coach, my, Mike, he comes in the dressing room. He's like, you know, he's, he's sad for me. Like he, it's tough, but he's like, so what do you think? And I'm like, Oh man, like, fuck. That's a bit, bit, a bit of a bummer. Like, I don't know what else to do. And he's like, so I don't know if this is the right time to ask or if there's ever going to be a right time, but would you ever consider giving Denny your spot? And like in that moment, it was a mixed emotions for me. Cause I was like, do not be so happy that you don't have to skate this thousand meters, but be, <laughs> be like somber enough that you're, you're graceful in giving it away. You know what I mean? Cause like at that point for being on the Olympic team, like it's like you as a Canadian Olympian, you just don't want to be on the line, just be on TV, man. You want to give yourself a shot to win. And I felt like I didn't need another opportunity just to be on TV, to skate and be like, hey, that's like, that's my buddy on TV, the skating, right? So I was like, shit, I'd fuck, I'll send him a text message right now. And so um, just got on my phone right away and, and texted Danny like, hey, man, would you consider racing a thousand in two days? And um, it's funny because we got given Russian phone numbers from the Olympic Committee. So he thought he was getting pranked by some Russians. He's like, he thought it was some random media guy being like, would you be ready to skate the thousand from CBC? And he's like, he gave this very diplomatic answer. He's like, I've been training for the past month. You know, like uh, if I get the call, I'll be ready to skate for my country. And I was like, what the fuck? Yo, Denny, it's Gil. What's up? And he's like, what the fuck? Are you actually giving me your, your, the spot? And I'm like, yeah, man, like I'm not going to win a medal. I think you can. And, um, yeah, it was like, it kind of just happened really fast. And, um, dude, I actually can't believe it happened the way it did. It almost seemed like a, like a, a Disney movie. And I remember sitting in the stands, watching him come across the line, second place, finishing in second. And like the, the, I was sitting with my team and they just like, they couldn't believe it either. They were giving me pats on the back and being like, you did this, you did this. And that was like one of the most, most embarrassing things for me. I'm like, I don't do shit. I didn't go <laughs> skate this. Like, <laughs> But it was it was definitely a cool moment to share with him and 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 Denny, uh, my coach gave me as a cred so I could go in the the infield to go watch the medal ceremony and, and share that like right before Denny went up to go get his medal, like he was able I got to see him right before and and got to sneak through security to to give him a hug and that's definitely like a moment that was like kind of no one's ever saw. There's only two people probably in the world that saw that moment, but like me and Denny and maybe like one other coach and but that's something that. Uh, it's like a cool moment to share with somebody for sure. And you said well, Denny the is the thing. homie. Denny is the homie, right? Denny Still. is the homie, man. Oh Shout yeah. Shout out yeah. Denny, We're, the homie, I saw bro. Him, I, I, I just saw him this past weekend. I texted uh, you. We're shotgunning hay y'alls. Yeah. <laughs> shotgunning. Oh. Are we going into the segment? Is it time? Is it time? Is it time what do you, you got something the, for or is it time? Our newest our newest guest segment. So we're gonna. This is gonna be a new thing that we're gonna start doing on the podcast. Because Luke's thing, when you go to, as it's as far as I'm concerned, almost anywhere it seems like. But Super Bowl parties, it's like you gotta be shotgun a beer. You gotta be shotgun a beer, right? Yeah. So we figured it, belly. we gotta muck it up a little bit. These Super Bowl parties, they're all nice. You said it earlier. I'm a Windsor kid. So manager Mark, who's in the background right now, me and him are always at Super Bowl parties. It's a tradition. We get the cans. This year, we actually had a shotgun out of one of those big ass tin things, like the I don't even know aluminum bottles. You know what I'm talking about? That was tough. I had because you had to twist the top, but we got that done. But uh, it's a big <laughs> thing for us. It's a big thing for us. It means a lot. It does mean a lot. Belly it develops it trust. It, it builds trust. It's, so there you are. I mean, 
I, I didn't so we're gonna do this all up. Keep talking about the we're new gonna segment. do this all up. We're gonna have producer Alec put together a nice little leaderboard. We're gonna get each guest to shotgun one beer, and we're just gonna time it. And we're just gonna, you know, we're hoping a month, two months from now, we're gonna have a nice little leaderboard. Maybe get a little competition going. We're, you know, the the rumor on the street is is we're gonna have to keep uh, Jordan Roos as far away from this contest if we want it to be close at all. So good luck. Gil. I will say this right uh, now. I will say this right now. You have hit. This is not edited. He has not shotgun the beer yet. When I'm saying this, Gil will beat Jordan so, Roos shotgunning this beer. Wow. I'm putting it out oh, there right whoa, now. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I have whoa. seen this man not shotgun, but I, I, and after hearing the speed skating stories from earlier about not being allowed in bars in Calgary, the smile on his face right now. I've seen this before. Right before Team Orange kicks our ass. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to say that this will be this will basically set the standard. Somebody might get him, but Gil will probably go back. I think this will be our number one for a long time. That's what I'm saying. I hope Bruce sees this, but I have a feeling this is going to be know, it. I'm a, I, I did watch that episode with Jordan Roos, and I'm a little scared of that guy. So that's that's high <laughs> praise. I don't know. Don't worry. He's the uh, homie. He's the homie. He's like Danny. Bro. He's, <laughs> he's the homie. homie. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. But, you know, with this being the leaderboard, I don't know if I want to give away my strategy of how I approach this. Luke told me yesterday or, you know, two days ago, this might be a thing. So I've uh, I've, I've game planned this out. Um, I don't know how it's going to go, really. I, I haven't shotgun beers in a while, but um, I don't, am I just doing this solo or what? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're on. We're, you're, you're on the clock, oh, too. Yeah. We're going to get Bright light. everyone get the phones out. We'll, we'll take the mean, the median yeah, we'll take time. The average time here. So I'm gonna start the this way, clock this trick- when I hear the when I hear the thing open. So I'm gonna we gotta be silent so I can hear the shit. By the way, so this was the trick that I, I like to show Luke when when we did a couple gunnies yeah. on uh, on set. Little hotel key card. You're giving away my Perfect secret sound because I stole a, that from you and a- I showed manager Mark that one. <laughs> no on, way! Did you call it for yourself? This is where I got it from, Mark. <laughs> Did you pull it for yourself? Of Jeez, course. Guys still in my party. Guys still in my party trick. That's oh man, totally I've been exposed. Real. I've been exposed. Oh man. Okay, all right. Here we go. I'm spilling. Okay, on the, the, the click. On the click. On the click. Hey, okay, one second. Let's gotta get a grip on this thing. Okay. Oh, I told you. Oh, Are you kidding my. me? A little spill. Oh, a little spill. A little spill. I got him at four seconds. I got four. Okay, we'll take it in between there. We'll call it. We'll call it four point three. There it is. (laughs) That's a a little bit of a spill in my lap. We'll go four point four because of the spill. What a time! Yeah, bro, he deleted that. Like a he he did delete that. At two tenths of that, that's like a four four. This man just hit a four four. It's like a forty time, bro. He, <laughs> Gil, that's and you did it seated. Control Alt Delete for Manager Mark. I should get uh, that. Should get my two tenths back for doing it seated. For real, that's gonna sit sit pretty poorly, I think. Wow, what a <laughs> statement! But see what I'm saying, Belly. This is exactly how the CBC show went. I would go. I'd be out of control. Be running my mouth. Blah blah blah. blah. I'd be talking all this shit, and Gil would just sit there, look at me like, look at this dumb fucking idiot. And then all of a sudden, it'd be like he'd roll out his two players or his full team, and then we would lose. And I'm like, God dang it. <laughs> every time. Every time, it seemed like. You got to play the long con. You got to play the long con. When people think you're down and out, that's when you strike. Yeah. Speaking speaking of thinking that you're down and out, we got to like I'd, – I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the Hayden Hurst night. That night was – There we go. Just like – you want to talk electric, you want to talk all time, whatever it is. I, I, I mentioned this to Luke a couple of days ago. My favorite part of that whole night still is one, Luke wasn't working. He was just coming in to watch the games. And two, you guys were in the car 15 minutes prior to the game starting. He was picking you up from the airport. You guys were stuck in traffic and Luke's just on the phone with me going, whatever you guys do, just make sure there's a Hayden Hurst anytime touchdown and yards on there. And I walked into the boardroom and I was like, uh put Hayden Hurst's name on the board I guess and then sure as shit there we are three hours later with like I still can't believe it for anyone that isn't up to speed with it 
Good luck, Gil comes to town. The fellas hit an 80 to one parlay on the last play of, of Thursday night football. I just, I couldn't, I still can't really wrap my head around it. I still can't really believe it, but just like what, what a night that was. Yeah. So I don't know what Luke told you or who was coming with him to the studio, like what he was prepping you for, but I had never bet on football or parlays or anything of that matter ever in my life. And um, I remember I messaged him the day before I was coming in for, for a little summit and he's like, bro, we might go, uh, you know, break fan duel. We might go downtown and watch the football game or we might go to the TSN studios. So I'm like, yo, that sounds sweet. I got an extra night. Let's do it. I get in the car. He picks me up. We're, I'm, I'm late. I got delayed. And that um, was you know, a I'm coming out of Pearson. Yeah. Just to give you, I didn't even know. I don't know if I told you this, but I'm like, shit, dude. I already promised these guys are going to TSN. And I kept texting Gil. And I'm like, where are you? Where are you? His yeah. flight was like 30 minutes late. <clears throat> I was already on the road. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to get Gil. And all of a sudden, my phone blows up. And he's like, yo, I just landed. We're late. And I veer yeah. over four lanes. I'm like, oh, shit. Good thing he texted me right now. <laughs> And, so. and, and he's not kidding. I come out of the airport at Pearson. Guys parked in the middle of the road. <laughs> Big Luke coming out, waving, go, Gil, let's go, let's go. Yeah, let's get it. So we get on the road, and, and I remember asking, I was like, yo, dude, so this whole parlay thing, like I've never bet on it, so how do you, how do you make your picks? I've been watching. Like is it like just your football knowledge, or do you have insider info from all the players? He's like, you know what, man, you just, just got to go on themes. You just got to go on game themes. I was like, well, what's the theme tonight? He's like, Hayden Hurst. Hayden Hurst is my theme. That's my guy. I think he's going to have a big night. And we're about 20, like 10 minutes out, game starting in 25 minutes. And then he's talking to you guys, put Hayden Hurst on, put the Hayden Hurst on. And uh, we get in and everyone's asking me for parlay. He's like, fuck, man, I don't know, Hayden Hurst, I guess. Like, that's, that's all Luke's been telling me. <laughs> Fast forward to, you know, 40 seconds left in the game, Bengals are on the two yard line third down and this was my favorite moment it was we're all sitting there bad of breath i think i don't know if it was luke or mitch to my side being like this is a tight end play i'm like sure why not <laughs> and as soon as hayden hurst goes in motion across like someone's like there it is there it is and absolutely blew the roof off the place david sanchez a sliding across the table luke saucing a water ball up in the air and i'm I ended up catching it, which was a fucking one of the craziest, the craziest things thing that ever. happened. It was crazier than her scoring in the last yeah. play of the game. That was, <laughs> that was the biggest thing that flew under the radar that night because I think like a week later I watched it back and I was like, "Holy shit!" Like Gil just caught a water bottle out of nowhere. How did how did that happen, dude? Yeah, I see Luke. He throws it up, <clears throat> go to hug him, and as I went go to close the hug, water bottle perfectly in my hands, just like this. And it was dude, outrageous. that night, like you said, that night, like you said, it was, it was electric. Speaking of Disney movies from earlier, this was a Disney movie, man. Like a bunch of ragtag group of people coming together to see if they can win some money. It's I remember texting my brother did. and, uh, you know, he, he's been betting on football for years. And I won more money than he has in one night than he has in like 10 years of betting on, <laughs> on football. And he's like, as if you freaking hit this, you know, you know, not the way you want to hit it with Tua. But like as yeah, soon as that happened, right. we're like, yo, this is this is right. kind of game on. Like we're we're in it, so um, I, I I did bet on more after that, but I to, to lesser to lesser degrees next of success. Year, next but year we'll get them. We'll get them back. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of like I have to be in the studio kind of thing, right? Like that's yeah. when we got to mix it up and, and well, do those big crazy bets. Honestly, I can't even make this up. So you come to town, we hit we hit an eighty to one, or we also hit like a twenty to one or that night. That just that was the other thing we yeah. hit we hit two that night. That was that was stupid. And then we, we went through a little bit of a, a dry spell. But, Luke, do you remember that uh, the Commanders-Eagles Monday nighter when I hit the parlay, the, the money line one, and the Commanders beat the Eagles, right? Of course. Either way, I hit, hit this long shot parlay on, uh, on Monday Night Football, and I'm like, what was different about tonight? Like, how is this – like, what did I see different this week? And sure as shit, I open up Instagram, and there's an Instagram story from Good Vibes Gill, and I click it. He's in Toronto. <laughs> he's in That's Toronto right. so, and I DM'd you and I was like dude like you're in the yeah. city and I just hit a huge parlay again like I don't know what's happening here but when he is either it's the same room or the same city as as at least one of us parlays are just flying so what was it oh here it is oh, boy. Oh, oh, my God. God. <laughs> 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 dude 
this was the water bottle. Oh, there's a slide. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've shown this to so many people, they cannot believe this happened. You know how dumb I felt up until that moment? Because... I remember... <laughs> I think the water bottle flip is coming right now. Oh, it ended. It's all good. Oh, we'll, we'll cut it later. But uh, I was Hayden Hurst stuff, ahead. and I'm like, Hayden Hurst. I don't know if you remember how this thing unplay, like unfolded. But he started, I think the first drive, you might have had a 15. He only needed like 22, and he might have had like a 15-yard catch. And I'm like, got it. And then he had like another five. And I'm like, I mean, this is going to hit on the second drive of the game. And then that leg, not the touchdown, obviously. The guy doesn't touch the ball the rest of the game. And I'm like, oh, no. And everything is <laughs> Jack, 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 Jack. And I'm the guy like, Aiden Hurst. And then all of a sudden, they're on the one. And I'm like, we're screwed. And then the funniest part, I think it was Mixon got a yeah. uh, minus one yard. yard. So it was third and two <laughs> from the two. instead of It was second and one from the one. And then third and two from the two. And I'm like, oh, we got action now, boys. I, I'll hit. never forget, yeah. I, and and Gil pointed out, I'll never forget watching him motion across the screen, and it was as he was motioning, everyone at the same time, it was like we were all like, oh, like this is it. He's gonna be open here. <laughs> he's yeah. This is him. Get that tight end motion. And, like, what are they up to? What are they up to right here? <laughs> dude, so look, I just I do want to say, how do you think I felt? You pumping me up as good luck, Gil. Good luck, Gil. You put it on your story, <laughs> and we're not hitting. I'm like. Yo, this guy's just pumped me up to his whole bo- – all his boys on being good luck killed, and I'm him. not hitting it. We slapped him that night. <laughs> well, I mean, absolute oh, slap. Dude. Yeah, we'll have to run good that back. The news is next year we we're going to have to back. do that. A good, In fact, I think we should do it early, like week two. Week one, you know, kind of yeah. you get to see what's going on a little bit. And then week two, just come in there, good luck kill, absolute thread the needle, 80 to one. And then we'll just go from there. You know what? I did have a surprise. I, I was I did try to make this happen. Didn't ever knew when I was going to get on the pod. But my plan was when I got on this podcast, I was going to have a Hayden Hurst jersey on. <laughs> I could not find a Hayden Hurst jersey in Calgary for the life of me. But guaranteed, next time when we run it back, I will have a Hayden Hurst jersey next time we watch a football game. Love Doesn't it. even have to be the Bengals. I mean, I will have that. Like, we got to lock that in. It's just yeah. it's going to be too good. Yeah, boys, this was this was a lot of fun. I had a great time sharing these stories and uh, reminiscing Gil, anything on some you good want times. to talk about that we didn't. And you know, you know, I tell these stories, but definitely, you know, it's not all fun and games and skating. It's um, you know, a pretty disciplined lifestyle, pretty strict. You know, we're training eleven months of the year, really grinding, and to help us prepare for the competition season. But um, yeah, it's uh, when we get a chance to really, you know, celebrate those uh, those moments together, and um, you know, they are kind of few and far between. But like I said, when when we get a chance to really celebrate, uh, you know, training blocks or end of string of competitions or the end of the season, you know, we get kind of uh, you know, we definitely rip it up. But um, you know, I think a lot of us known each other since we were like sixteen years old, or you know, maybe younger. And you know, a lot of us have known the struggles that each one have each one of us has gone through, and so it makes those moments you know, a lot more special, uh, to share with those guys. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it gets a little out of control, but, uh, in a good way. And, uh, you know, we just have a lot of fun and, um, you know, I really cherish those, cherish those moments. You know, I just want to say like, I don't think I get to talk about my boys enough. You know, all the guys that helped me out, Danny, Jamie, Will, we didn't get to talk about Will. And I mentioned him. He's a guy that I borderline hated a couple of years, big rivalry, but, so much respect. And it's like when you train with a guy like that, you know, we push each other to be a lot better. And it's guys like that that I was able to have not only as much success that I've had in my career and be able to have opportunities like to be on CBC with, with Luke, but to have like all these amazing memories because we had a lot of great times of just skating hard and, and playing hard. So, you know, shout out to those boys, all the guys that helped me. And, um, you know, hopefully they get can get a little bit of a laugh from – you know some of these story uh, stories are airing, although not not too many, I don't think, but a couple of them at least. <laughs> Gil, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, you coming on here. It was a fun chat, um, you know. And I've said this to your face; I'll say it on here. Like, I think one of the coolest things for you, 
when I'm looking at it is, I mean, three Olympics, that's 12 years at the highest level. That is a long time. I mean, I felt like eight in the NFL was an eternity. There are guys who have played longer than that, obviously, but to go 12 years where you're just that great is not only a testament to your talent, but also so many characteristics that you have, you know, and, uh, it's been great, you know, out of all the strife that the CBC show may have caused me mentally, <laughs> meeting you, man, makes it all worth it, my guy. So Thanks, I appreciate brother. you coming hey, on here. Right and back this was you. tight. <laughs> this right back tight. at you, man, boys. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks, Gil. What a chat, eh? What a guy. Dude, he, I can't. Good vibes, Gil. Good vibes, Gil. Good time, Gil. I was glad we got to go through that video. Yeah. Like, dude. In, in what's fun and you can kind of see it and even like I always laugh belly because and this is I, I know we keep talking about the show but it was like in the NFL especially under Pete Carroll it was always like you know show emotion show emo, like show that kind of shit and yeah. it was like in Canada I find that it's kind of a lot like the opposite you know like don't do that don't do those things so like to, to kind of get to know Gil and like I always felt like there was an internal battle going on with my guy because if they didn't do well, you could tell he was pissed. And I'm like, dude, Gil's pissed. <laughs> so to hear him be like, yo, when I was a kid, I was throwing punches. I love that shit. And then to see him win that 500, bro, he was flying on that thing. Yeah. I, speed skating speed skating's awesome. Like I'm a very casual, you know, winter sports guy. But whenever the Olympics roll around, it's like speed skating. It's one of those that you just got to watch because – Yes, especially the 500. Shit, those like guys that. fly. Yeah. Bro, he was flying on that. And he gets the dub and it's just flex. Like, ah, I'm like, that's tight. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, before we wrap up, we I do want to do some NFL stuff because, you know, I get to have a podcast with a former NFL player. So I like getting your, your opinions on things. Uh, it feels like there's no better place to start than this Lamar Jackson situation. Uh, what am I missing here? 26-year-old former league MVP his team's not giving him a deal and nobody wants to speak with him. I don't know. The whole nobody wants to speak with him is very confusing to me. So that one, I, I can't wrap my head around. Yeah. I can tell you what I know from like personal experience. And when I was in Baltimore, he's beloved in the locker room. The dudes love him. You know, I also think, I mean, he's, I know I use this term quite a bit, but he might be the most electric player in the NFL. Like when it comes down to it, he can do everything. And the whole like knock his like throwing game. I think he's got a strong arm, but like his offense was not really built to be like a, like a throw in 45 times a game style offense. Like that's not Greg Roman's MO who's no longer the OC there. So, where I go, the only thing that can kind of like make sense to me is I have a feeling the front office of the Ravens, they've been kind of close. They're usually, you know, right there. And then all of a sudden it's like, if you look at how the Ravens have won the Super Bowl, not had success, but won the Super Bowl, you think Ray Lewis, you think Ed Reed, you know, you don't think Joe Flacco. And sometimes when you're kind of like always on the, you know, one step away, it seems like you sit there and you're like, why are, you know, are we maxed out right now? Like, how did we win in the past? Well, we have a blueprint to win and that's through defense. So we don't want to necessarily come out here and spend all of this money on a quarterback that's going to handcuff us elsewhere. But yeah. again, where I would, I am not in that camp. I want to be very honest with you, Bell, Bell. So I'm not in that camp. If that's even the camp that they're thinking, but it's like, you look at, Lamar and I'm just like this guy can do everything and I'm telling you he is a great great person in that locker room and everybody loves him so I don't really understand like let's say you let Lamar walk what like who are you gonna you're just get? looking for the next Lamar right like you're not he's not walking through that door anytime soon no in in you know as we've seen with certain quarterbacks it's not always apples to apples when you get a new guy in town. You know, you think like you look at Denver and it's like, hey, we think we're going to get Russ from Seattle where it's like, 
it was a different system, different vibes. Like Russ kind of grew up there. Everything plays into it. And it's yeah. like, and I'm not saying Russ can't have a bounce back here, but it's like with Lamar, like who they go out and get someone else. Like, do you just think he's going to come in there? The locker room's going to have a little animosity towards if there's some ends up being somebody new because they're like, you're you're not Lamar. Lamar's our guy. He's clearly not going to be as athletic as Lamar. I'll tell you that right now. I'll tell you that one for free. Okay. And it's just like, I don't get how you're not like, yo, let's figure this out. Let's lock this in. But maybe it's the defensive angle. That's the only thing I can think of. Do you give any um, any second thought to the idea of it being collusion between the owners? I don't even know if we can like really talk about this, but there is the theory that's been floated that after the Deshaun Watson deal with all the guaranteed money, you know, the 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 traditional thing with quarterbacks is reset the market, reset the market, right? The talk is have the owners decide to put their foot down and say, no, like the Cleveland Browns fucked up. They should not have given Deshaun Watson that contract. We're not going to let anyone reset the market. So the Ravens aren't going to pay him. And like the Atlanta Falcons, 15 minutes after the Ravens non uh, tendered him or whatever that um, thing is, yeah. just came out, came out and we're like, we're not speaking to Lamar. And that I can't really wrap my head around. Like, why not even have the conversation? So do you think it's possible that these owners have gotten together and said, hey, like, we're, we got to make an example of someone and there's a 26 year old former league MVP and that's a hell of an example to make because if you shut out Daniel Jones and you say hey we're not paying Daniel Jones well good Daniel yes. Jones wasn't going to reset the market Daniel Jones shouldn't be making that top top tier money but when you do it with a guy like Lamar Jackson it, it puts the rest of the league on notice it puts future quarterbacks on notice to say hey like you, you you're not just going to walk in here without an agent and demand $300 million. We're not doing that anymore. I I think that's a very great take. We'll never be able to prove it, but that is a phenomenal take. That's, phenomenal that's the internet, take. man. The internet will do that. Uh, the other uh, topic that's got the internet a buzz is uh, Brett Favre's going to the Jets. My uh, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, <laughs> he's doing the Favre. He's he's doing the Favre. He, was, he, he won a Super Bowl in Green Bay. His... The next guy was drafted, and it pissed him off. He's played out the string. He's going to the Jets. He's going to be a Viking two years from now. Shout out uh, producer Kyle Lawson. He's going to like that. You know, Aaron Rodgers in the New York media. Like, how's that going to? How's that going to go? It to me. It, before I throw it to you here, it already seems like it's kind of off to a weird start. They met with him. We're recording this on the 14th. They met with him about a week ago. It seems like that meeting went well. It was like the Rodgers news is coming. The Rodgers news is coming. He hasn't signed. Now a list has emerged of free agents that he wants them to target. They just brought in Alan Lazard. There's rumors of them being linked to Randall Cobb. He wants Oral Mercedes Beckham Lewis, Jr. There. OBJ. Like it just seems like, yeah. you know, the show from Green Bay is going to follow him to New York. How do you think that plays out uh, if he does make the jump to the Jets? Or when really he makes well. the jump to the Jets? Really well extremely well um and i think that this whole list like i'm sure a lot of people are like oh he's being a diva i don't think he's being a diva at all i mean he's the most talented guy in the game right now all right and my whole thing is like when you're aaron Rodgers, you, and you've done this like you can tell he's frustrated and everyone wants to say yo he's a diva he's blah blah blah, blah. and sure but bro he's that good i'm telling you belly he's that good so then it's like if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I'm doing the same thing. And it's easy to fly to New York. They probably took him to some nice steakhouse. Let me tell you what the culture we're building around here. Blah, 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 blah. And he probably said, well, put your fucking money where your mouth is in. Get my boys in here, who I trust. Yeah. Guys like Randall Cobb, who's going to be a great vet for, you know, Garrett Wilson. Guys like that. And then you look at the defense. The defense is loaded. You look at Robert Sala, and it's like, yo, I had him. He was our D-line coach my first year in Seattle when we won the Super Bowl. And then oh, he wow. was obviously the D coordinator in San Fran. And it's like this guy everywhere he's been is known as like a man of character. He went to an organization that seemed like nobody could win consistently at. And it certainly looks like he's set up to do it now. And now all of a sudden you add Aaron Rodgers into that fold. So I'm sure there's a little give and take where Aaron's like, yo, I'm going to come to New York and be the final piece so that we go to the 
championship. We go to the bowl. But, like, y'all need to show me that you're willing to commit some shit. So you saw, like, hey, we've got Alan Lazard, clearly a guy he liked. Cobb has been a guy he's loved everywhere, and he trusts, you know. And yeah. then the OBJ thing, I don't, I will see. I, I don't think that's going to be a make or break thing for A Rod. But it would just be like a nice gesture, like, bro, we're bought in. We're bought into giving you weapons. And yeah. uh, I really think, especially with that defense, that team can be disgustingly good. And they have a great, great coaching staff. And it's it's that's an interesting division. I don't think we have the time to to fully dive into the AFC East tonight. But you know, like the Dolphins go out and you know they add Jalen Ramsey to that defense. They have the question marks at quarterback with Tua. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, uh, question marks at QB. The, the, the Patriots are, you know, the Patriots feel like they're probably a couple years away. And then the Bills, you know, the Bills the second half of the season weren't Very exactly above average. The, you know, the the team that yes. we expected to see. And, like, the Jets were winning games with Joe Flacco at quarterback last year, right? You know, the, Mike White was slinging it around. Zach Wilson was making starts. Like, you're bringing a guy like Aaron Rodgers. You get him a couple pieces he likes with that defense. And, like you pointed out, you know, Bob Sala. The dude seems to just be a winner. Everywhere he goes, winning kind of follows him. So it's an interesting it's an interesting division. The, the, Jets, are a, I, the Jets are back, you know. Jets Not are, since the, they get A-Rod, they're a big back, too. I, I saw I saw one tweet uh, a couple days ago, so forgive me if this is incorrect, but apparently they haven't been on Sunday Night Football since like 2011, when Rex Ryan and Mark Sanchez were the one-two punch. So it, it, it's well, safe that. to assume that that probably changes this year with no uh, question with Aaron Rodgers coming to town. Probably get them and the Bills on a Sunday night. But uh, that'll be fun. You know, it's always fun when when like New York sports teams are, are buzzing. Uh, a yep. couple years ago with the Knicks at the Garden, you know, the Jets, you know, it's just everything seems to be, even with all the exposure we have to the internet and everything nowadays, it just seems like when, when shit's going down in New York, it just feels elevated. And so it's it is it's going to be pretty neat seeing, uh, seeing Aaron Rodgers play as a Jet and how the media plays that out because I'm sure it won't be an absolute shit show. Uh, before we wrap up here, we got to give our we got to give some flowers to to two guys that you know, two guys you played with. Your boy Gino got paid. Your Hell boy Gino yeah. got paid. The haters wrote him off. He didn't write back. It was a great <laughs> bounce back season for Gino. Just give me give me a minute hmm. on on Gino Smith and uh, and this new contract extension. We haven't had the chance to talk about it. Hmm. Belly, I couldn't be happy for the dude. I mean, the moment I was in Seattle and he was there, I was like, damn. This dude is good as fuck, bro. Like, he was backing up Russ, and he had just, like, every, you know, physical talent that you can even think of as a quarterback. And then the longer I was there with him, and just the way he, like, prepped day in and day out. And Russ was an Iron Man there. You know what I'm saying? Up until his last year, Russ really didn't get hurt. And it never really seemed like he was going to get hurt. So... It just like t- t- that kind of grit, that kind of tenacity, that kind of like persistence. Every day, I'm telling you, I'd be like, this guy is incredible, a quarterback. And, uh, you know, he gets a shot, he wins a job in camp. And I always joke, I'm sure, producer Alec can pick it up. But I put a tweet out there, call my shot. I'm like, Gino about to be on fire this year, bro. He about to ball out. I can't remember the exact thing is. Got picked up by a lot of Seattle people. But I'm like, it was not surprising because I've seen how good this guy is. But beyond that, especially at that position, I've seen the mentals, bro. I've seen the mentals. Not just like, yo, I can read coverage mentals either, but just the mental fortitude. Wait, you know, the guys in the locker room fucking love him. Uh, And there's something to be said about that, Belly. Like, even for me, it, it sounds weird. But at that level, like when you go in the huddle and there's dudes that you just like really have a bond with and, I have some crazy amount of respect for you just, it makes it so much easier to just go that little extra bit, you know, harder where you're just playing for somebody that you really like love and have a bond for and just appreciate and respect. And and that's why I think Seattle had so much success last year, you know, and that's why I think they're going to have a lot of success next year too with the picks, baby. Don't sleep. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, and before we get out of here, real quick, big week for uh, for your guy, Darren Waller. 
uh, marries Kelsey Plum about a week ago, gets traded to the Giants today. Like I said, we're recording this on the 14th. Uh, just a just a great story, you know, a dude that's been through a lot of ups and downs, a lot of adversity in his career. It's 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 been a pretty good week in the to be Darren Waller, and I know you uh, you overlapped with him at at uh, the Ravens, Oakland. right? Yeah. Oh, at Oakland. No, Oakland. So here's a fun one for you, Belly. He was the story was, and I can't confirm this, that basically he was on the Ravens P squad. And the Raiders saw him running routes and like doing half gassers before the game. And the next day he was on the Raiders. I had no idea who the dude was. I signed in the offseason there and Gruden's like, yeah, here's our tight end situation. He's like, we got this kid Waller. And he's like, yeah, you know, he's more of a wide receiver. He's not even a tight end. Don't worry about that. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't think it'd be like college. And I, I like John Gruden. I don't want to, like, drag him on here. But, I mean, short time I had with him. Well, Bro, I show up. I'm like, this motherfucker ain't no goddamn wide receiver. <laughs> this is the most athletic tight end in the NFL. <laughs> the fuck is this? <laughs> what the fuck is this? He's acting like he ain't shit. Bro, we go in the first OTA or whatever. Not even OTA. Like, day one of offseason. And Gruden gets up in front of the whole team. And is like, we got the best kept secret in the entire NFL at tight end. I'm like, who's he talking about? It certainly ain't me. He's like, Darren Waller. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. You know, but beyond that, uh, he was a very good dude. Very good dude. You know, the story about his recovery, everything he's been through, uh, pretty special. And now, you know, to get him in an offense, you know, I think Brian Dable will really use him extremely well and uh, very special talent, just a my experience with Darren is nothing but extremely positive. So I hope everything goes well for him. I'm happy for him. Yeah. Darren's a, like, he's just a monster. Uh, monster, bro. Freak. Like, like you said, it's, it's, it's nice to see him. Uh, it's nice to see him succeed. And I look forward to talking about him more next year with the giants, but we've already taken up too much of everyone's time right now, but we got, you know, a little carried away today. It's our first episode back since the Super Bowl, so we had a little bit extra extra time to kill. Um, as always, thank you to producer Alec on the ones and twos for putting this all together. Thank you to, uh, thank you to, thank you to, you know, to Gil for joining us, gave us a bunch of time, some good stories. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that. Mr. Luke Wilson, I know you're a busy man with a lot going on, so always good getting to sit down and chat with you and uh the you, if you're hearing this on the day it came out it is thursday that is the plan for the off season new episodes every thursday until the nfl season starts and then uh, we'll figure some stuff out moving from there unless you got anything to add luke i think that's going to do it for us welcome back baby season two off season yes, let's go good shit see you next time <laughs>